So I'm Christine uh, Evans, the Director of Product Marketing and Content here at Fictive. Um, so today's webinar is module three of our DFM for CNC machining masterclass, how to optimize DFM for complex mechanical designs. Um, and a reminder that you can take the full free course um, at fictive.com slash masterclass in our resource center. So I highly recommend that if you haven't um, reviewed the content in the webinars from modules one and two, that you um, go to the resource center and you can find links to both the on-demand learning content as well as the on-demand webinars for module one and two, and make sure that um, you get all the information about um, DFM optimization from simple parts through to the most advanced and complex, which is what we're going to cover today. Additionally, uh, a small housekeeping item. Um, if you want to post in the chat to everybody attending, just make sure in the Zoom that you switch the, the two field to all panelists and attendees, and then um, everybody will be able to see your questions and comments. All right, so um, joining us today for our webinar, I'm thrilled to introduce you to an amazing panel of experts in engineering and design. Uh, first of all, we have Greg Miner, who is the owner of Greg Miner Development and an incredible product development specialist with more than 500 products under his belt across industries from aerospace, compute storage, consumer electronics. Greg, so excited to have you here. Um, please introduce yourself and share a bit more about your background for the audience as well. Thank you, Christine. I appreciate the opportunity. I really enjoy these webinars and I hope that it shares some of the information and the background I have. Uh, my name is Greg Miner. My background is machining, model making, product design, product development, as well as manufacturing. Um, over my 20 year career, I've had great opportunity to work with some of the most innovative companies um, Apple, HP, Intel, Logitech, Google, Bell Helmets, the North Face, um, Hasbro and Anton Toys. So I have a breadth of like multiple disciplines in multiple areas and I've been very fortunate to have that. My most recent um, stint was with uh, Facebook Oculus as their AR VR um, PD Group Innovation Manager where we had four groups at two sites, Menlo Park in Seattle. And it encompasses in a full prototyping capability, state-of-the-art three and five axis CNC, 3D printers, laser cutters, water jets, welding and sheet metal fabrication, as well as RTV and injection molding. Um, we also had a small group of um, DVT and PVT technicians that helped us assemble pre-production models and, and work those out. So um, I've been very blessed to have lots of experience and lots of disciplines, and I'm excited for the program today. Thank you so much, Greg. Uh, we're also joined by William Burke, who is the co-founder and CEO of Five Flute, and also has um, incredible experience in mechanical engineering, also being the former um, director of engineering at Cooper Perkins Product Development, for example. Um, William, thank you so much also for being here. Please um, share a bit more about your background and expertise. Thank you. Why do I have to follow Greg's intro? That's just hard to compete with. So, uh, But I appreciate it, Christine. I'm stoked to be here. Um, yeah, so I spent the bulk of my career uh, as a design engineer, uh, a stint at Cooper Perkins doing product development, product engineering. Um, but I also did a three-year stint at, uh, in manufacturing at a company called Plethora, uh, where I helped build out their CNC machining capabilities, uh, manage their production team. Um, so I think I've got a bit of a unique perspective, right? I've seen CNC machining from the supply and demand side. Uh, and I kind of know the pitfalls on both sides, and so I hope I can bring that. Uh, perspective to the to this webinar. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like my previous career, the bulk of my career as a design engineer, 15 years or so. Um, but these days, I spend my time building uh, software tools for product developers and uh, and hardware engineering teams. Um, so that's what Five Flute is all about, right? Five Flute is a we're basically a web application that helps hardware teams design, build, and learn faster, iterate faster. So that that includes coordination within teams. So collaboration and bug tracking tools for hardware builds, uh, coordination with external vendors. So that's, uh, you know, quote request, vendor management, DFM and purchasing tools. And then there's kind of a whole project management layer built on top of it all. So uh, you can make sure your <clears throat> development efforts, efforts and prototyping efforts stay on schedule and on budget. So anyway, thanks for having me. Stoked to be here. Fantastic. Thanks so much, William. Uh, and last but certainly not least, 
Uh, David Cagle is a senior mechanical applications engineer here at Fictive, um, who also comes from Burb Surgical. So Dave, do you wanna share um, a bit more about uh, your background as well? Yeah, uh, like Christine said, uh, senior technical applications engineer or senior mechanical engineer here at Fictive, uh, mainly at, at Fictive, I review a lot of parts uh, work with all of you and the engineers uh, to get the requirements necessary. Background all the way from aerospace, uh, doing time at Rolls-Royce to the United States uh, Air Force Base to Pratt & Whitney, and then doing medical devices for Johnson & Johnson out of Ethicon. And then uh, latest uh, design engineering experience was a lead design engineer at Verb Surgical doing medical robotics, uh, which that company was then acquired by J&J. And now I'm here at Fictive uh, trying to help all of the design engineers uh, bring their products to life and get their parts in hand. So looking forward to talking to all of you. So I'm going to continue uh, with this presentation, I guess. And we're going to first start with a poll, uh, ask the audience, and uh, just to make sure you guys are all still awake. And the first question we want to ask you is, for your projects, what design requirements create the most complex manufacturing challenges for you? When you think about it, is it really centered around your geometry, your tolerance, uh, the size of your part, material, look and feel, or is for you individually is a combination or a culmination of a mix match of those of those attributes? And let me pull this over. I'm just gonna answer. Two. Do I have to answer? Oh, I cannot vote. Do you have any uh, any guesses, David? You know, based on working with our customers, like where do you see some of the the biggest challenges? So, as a design engineer, usually for me, I'm usually worried about the part geometry and the tolerance, um, size, material, look and feel. Those usually uh, size and material are related to the geometry and my requirements and. Uh, look and feel is usually my individual last thing I tackle because it's the last part of, I gotta make it work first. All right, let's see, so sharing out the results here, it seems pretty much in line, definitely tolerances uh, being the number one challenge that people are seeing. Gotcha, okay. Well, as we, thank you for that information and uh, we will definitely cover um, as a prelude, all of these things in the remainder of the presentation here. Uh, and we will also bring up a lot of the tolerance uh, requirements and details that are related to helping to dial in your, in your project and your part. Um, so moving on to the next slide, we're gonna quickly go over the agenda. Um, first, just to start off, uh, this is course number three uh, for our DFM masterclass. So we wanna review uh, very quickly the definition of what we're calling manufacturing effort and go through some common capabilities of CNC shops again, and then also kind of bring forward a more uh, think like a machinist and the, the test for manufacturability. And each of these we've broken down into uh, subtopics, feature accessibility, resolution, drivers of tolerance, as you guys all voted on, and then material selection along with work holding. And like we said, really part of this is we, if we can encourage you right now to start thinking like the machinist. If you were the machinist, how would you do this? How would you go about these things? And as you start thinking this way, you'll really start to understand and uh, be able to make progress on how to get your parts made. So moving forward on this, uh, right? So in the theory of think like a machinist, we want a baseline and we want to set our zero. So if we're setting our zero, I want to uh, bring forward the definition of what are we calling least effort? And so for us, we're calling this a, a measure of time, care, and challenge to manufacture your design. Um, as we're going forward and looking at the different parameters that are involved in this, uh, because we're all stuck on Zoom and uh, stuck to 2D slides here, we've created a little graphic where our kind of origin is at the middle. And geometry, tolerance, look and feel, material, part size, all of these things uh, become increasing in complex as we drive outward for this scale. So the point of this is that the middle of it, that is the least effort. The point of this diagram is think of the origin as just your stock. And that requires very little efforts, nothing to really do to it. Um, but as your design requirements are involved with creating your part in the design, each of those attributes can bring incremental effort to 
what it takes to ma manufacture your part. And so previously we've gone through and we've talked about least effort, uh, incremental effort. And today we really wanna focus on things that are requiring maximum effort. Um, we'll look at what each of the, how each of these attributes drives towards maximum effort. And as we go forward and we talk about this, um, just think about all of the mechanical principles and equations that you've known for a long time in your engineering career, but now are pushing you to the edge of many capabilities. So first, William's gonna dive deeper into this uh, and really talk about tests for manufacturing capabilities. Yeah, and so before we get into the specific tests, actually, I think uh, it's good to review kind of the common capabilities uh, of CNC machine shops, right? And so really looking at this from the perspective of tools and setups. Right, and of course, different shops are gonna have different specializations, different capital equipment in terms of machines, uh, different expertise, different stuff that they just like to do, right? But it's really valuable to understand the commonalities and capability between these shops as a design engineer so you can get a sense for uh, what's effectively free and what's more costly in your part designs. Um, so we're, you know, maybe the key difference in this webinar from other ones is that we're, out, we're outside of the landscape of uh, simple rules for design in terms of like, length and diameter ratios for end mills and stuff like that. We're kind of into the realm of think like a machinist and let, let those first principles guide you uh, in, in your design choices. Um, and without this kind of basic understanding of common capabilities, uh, I think you're gonna have a much more difficult time reasoning through the relationship between your design choices uh, and the manufacturing effort that they imply uh, you know, as constrained by costs and schedule and quality outcomes that you're looking for for your parts. So let's move on to common tools. Um, so this is by no means uh, exhaustive, but um, we thought it was just a great idea to take a look at, you know, what we considered the most common tools across job shops. Uh, you know, what are the tools that you can reliably assume that every machine shop will have, uh, you know, and what does that imply about features that you design? Um, so from, from left to right, <clears throat> excuse me, from left to right, we've got a face mill. Uh, some folks call this a shell mill, but uh, there's some subtle differences there, but effectively a large tool used for decking uh, stock and flattening material. Uh, and then you've got the most ubiquitous tool in the shop, the square end mill, a bullnose end mill, ball end mill, chamfer mill, uh, key seat cutter, cutting taps, and a slitting saw. Uh, and we've excluded drill bits from this because it's sort of obvious that folks will have those. Um, but really this is the core arsenal of most machine shops. You're gonna, they're gonna have these tools in different geometries, different variants in terms of, uh, you know, material, uh, and coatings and manufacturers, but the vast majority of features, uh, you design as a, as an engineer will be made by one of these, uh, eight tools. All right. So the same thing applies to, uh, to setups, right? And I think. Uh, let's define a setup first, right? Uh, one way to think about it is that it's a, a work holding and machine combination, right? So like a, a curt vise in a, in a three axis vertical milling center is a setup. Um, but you're answering the question, you know, what holds the stock material and how is it held in the machine, you know, relative to the machine? Right, so this is just kind of a, a few common setups uh, in order of increasing effort from left to right. Um, so of course the simplest setup is just a basic machine vise gripping on some square stock. Uh, second from the left, you've got uh, probably the most ubiquitous job shop setup. So this is a double vise where the left vise is doing a first operation and the right vise has a soft jaw fixture. Uh, so you're flipping that part on the left into the jaws on the right to you know, cut the second operation. Um, from there, uh, third from the left is a five axis uh, dovetail vise setup that gives you uh, access to five sides of the part and portions of the sixth side if it's overhanging. Uh, and then on the right, you see more of a higher volume uh, gang production uh, fixture plate, uh, but basically a custom fixture plate that uh, in this case is using a Mighty Bite pit bull clamps to hold uh, 16 separate pieces of stock. So this is kind of the core arsenal in terms of uh, setups that most shops are gonna, gonna use, uh, most you know, machining strategies you're gonna see. So if you can design within this context, uh, you're really gonna save yourself a lot of effort. All right, so 
with those common capabilities in mind, um, let's look at our first test for manufacturability. So uh, feature accessibility is what we wanna think about. And basically, can the tool reach the feature in the current setup, right? These are questions, <laughs> this is a question you wanna ask yourself uh, early and often throughout the design process to help you think like a machinist. Um, so, and almost on a, a feature by feature basis, right? What tools can I bring to bear on my part to make that feature? Are there other features in the way? Uh, is it possible with common tools? Is uh, the work holding in the way? Does it imply certain constraints in terms of tool geometry and holder selection? Um, does it you know, require multi-axis machining over three axis? Uh, you know, again, there's no simple, uh, there's no simple answer to this. We're going to kind of go through a methodology for how to think about it, but these are things you want to think about early, early and often. All right, and so one of the ways that you can help yourself think through this uh, is with the concept of cut vectors, um, and the cut vectors are basically the surface normals of the tool. Um, and so, really, this comes down to understanding, you know, what kinds of tools can make what features or can make each feature, uh, what part of the tool does the cut and how must it be oriented relative to the work, work piece. And then from there, how many setups does this imply? Uh, and can you as a design engineer uh, make smart decisions to, to minimize that, that number of setups or simplify it? And so this is a really simple uh, part example here of just kind of a, a three axis prismatic part. Um, being cut with a square end mill, uh, but it just helps helps you visualize how you might think through that process, right? What faces can the tool access? Is the are the is the tool long enough? Is, are the cutting flutes long enough to hit those those faces? Is there work holding in the way? Is it like device jaws? Um, it's a really simple example, but this is what you want to get in the habit of uh, visualizing throughout your design process. So something that I like to do. Uh, to kind of build my intuition is actually just bring tools and tool holders into a CAD environment. And so this is stuff you can get from, uh, you know, Harvey tool, you can get tool models from Mari tool, you can get tool holder models, or you can just hop on GrabCAD like I did. Um, so I've got a CAD 40 uh, ER32 holder here uh, with a 10 millimeter end mill. And I've just brought it into a CAD environment with this simple part. So looking at this yellow face, Right, I'm asking myself, you know, what are the possible orientations for my tool and tool holder combination that can cut this face or cut the entirety of this face? And so in this example, that's basically uh, B, right? That's the only setup that will allow me to reach the whole entire face, um, you know? And so can I, can I come up with another tool? <laughs> Obviously I wouldn't deck the top of this part with a 10 millimeter end mill, I'd probably use a face mill, but, um, you know, can I come up with another tool and tool holder combination that minimizes effort uh, or reduces setups in some way? So if we look at the next example here, uh, that's basically what this kind of tool trade-off is, is showing here. So uh, can you bring in tool choice as a variable? So for the, for the red highlighted face there, uh, if I'm cutting that with a square end mill, I'm gonna need to orient the spindle normal to that face. And that for this part probably Im implies uh, at least one extra fairly complicated setup on a three axis mill and, uh, or maybe a five axis setup. Um, and so can we get creative with a ball end mill or a bullnose end mill and think about surfacing that face? And then what does that imply in terms of the requirements of my part, right? Can I accept uh, the impact on the surface finish of that red face by hitting it with uh, a ball or bullnose end mill uh, in exchange for reduced number of setups? Uh, or if I need a great surface finish, can I accept the increased machine time that comes with uh, using a ball end mill with a really, really fine uh, step over there? So these are the things that your machinists are going to be looking at, and uh, they're going to take your requirements and try to translate into a cogent strategy for how to make the part. But uh, you can save yourself a lot of headache if you try to do that before you actually you know, cut a print or send a step file out. Thanks, William. Um, I'm going to cover kind of feature resolution. And, and in that, uh, can the tools available make the feature? And I think one of the things that we're trying to highlight here is, is not so much becoming a machinist, but thinking about how this part is actually going to be made. And um, 
one of the things that I think you need to do is develop a relationship with either the manufacturer, the machinist, or the person that's actually doing that work. Because then you start to understand, number one, how they're going to approach the problem and how they're going to attack the problem, and then what tools they have in their facility so they can do that. And I, I'm going to kind of give you an example of one extreme versus another, and I've worked in both. Most recently, I finished a, a stint with uh, Facebook Oculus where we had multi-million dollar five axis machines with pallet changers and extreme amounts of tolerances to where the tool library in these Hermley CNCs was 130 plus versus a job shop friend of mine that has four Haas VF3s and VF4s where he's got a 30 to a 40 tool library that he's dealing with. And those are kind of like extremes on both ends, but understanding what the tools are and what the capabilities are helps you really design the part and what you're gonna get out of that part. And again, we talk about, you know, the risk versus reward. Um, and in certain environments, you have endless amounts of time, endless amounts of money, and they're trying to get the most accurate. And, and what we want, we want to talk about is how do you get most efficient from what you're trying to accomplish? And there's kind of two components in that. Are we doing a proof of concept, meaning are we just proving out an idea and doing something very simplistic to get that geometry, get that design, get it vetted and doing that to an actually extreme where we're looking at whether we're going to manufacture this or make multiples of this design and how are we going to actually optimize that design. Um, and there's two things that you need to take into consideration when you're evaluating those things is if there's going to be multiple operations on this geometry, how is it best to attack that? Meaning, is it as simple as creating more fixtures in a three axis machine that may only have a curved vice and have some opportunity to do multiple fixtures to align your part and get the geometry cut? Or is it more economically and better to use a five axis machine, pay a little bit more, but you'll actually be able to do those operations in maybe one or two operations, which again is time and money. So it's kind of a trade off that you have to evaluate on what phase of the part you're, you're in, proof of concept and concept development, or actually looking towards going more in towards the multiple parts and finalizing your design and geometry. Um, one of the, next slide, one of the, the key areas is that we're constantly evaluating is the tools that you're using and how to get the best finish and tolerance out of that. And this diagram just kind of illustrates or simply illustrates how if you're doing a basic pocket routine, understanding what the tool can do or its capabilities and doing a deep plunge and then having a small radius. Now, what you need to understand is what does that small radius actually articulate? And is that radius going to affect my geometry, meaning your final part, or does it nest with something else, say that another part was going inside? And do I need that radius inside of that thing? A lot of times working with engineers and designers, they'll put a really tiny radius because that's what they want at the very, you know, pristine and done. But in order to prove of concept, what you want to do is literally look at your part and get that done. Again, are we using a three axis with multiple uh, fixtures or are we using, you know, a five axis that can do the part in one thing, as well as looking at the tool library. If you have a three inch tool that's half inch diameter ball mill and, you know, creating this part versus you have a two inch with a 1 16th inch diameter, does that really necessary for you to drive that part? Um, next slide. And so um, the things that you look for is what you want to have trade-offs, time versus money versus quality versus tolerance and understanding what your uh, counterpart, your machinist or your manufacturer is doing helps you understand these things. Same thing could go with standoffs and bosses. Is it going to, is the person that you're interacting with and the capabilities they have going to pull off the design and the geometry that you need? Understanding, you know, what you can do as far as uh, standoff and bosses and the height that you have to get those two may result in a change of your geometry. Meaning that if you've got a standoff or a boss that's two and a half inches high, is that really necessary? Is there another way to think about your geometry? And is it make it easier and more uh, a higher or a better tolerance when you're actually doing that? Because when you talk about length of cutter and taking off material, there's several things that enter into that. There's vibrations, there's chatter, there's quality, there's tolerance, 
All of those things you need to be thinking about when you're actually doing the design of the geometry and, and trying to get the best products that you can. Um, next slide. The thing that comes into a question is proof of concept, meaning one or two parts or multiple parts and how you use common cutters, ball end mill, bowl end mill, uh, regular end mill or other tools that are in a normal tool library. And where you're gonna to have to ask yourself is, you know, is the feature that I'm cutting going to be covered uh, in an end mill or a ball end mill, or am I gonna to have to do customized tooling? And customized tooling um, nowadays can be done relatively quickly and somewhat in a, uh, efficiently and a, um, not a lot of money or time tied up in that. And so one of the things that you wanna think about is literally, if I'm doing one or two, um, does this need a custom cutter or can the person providing the service, the machinist or the manufacturer, do this with a couple of different setups? Now, as you gravitate and move into the 50 to 100 to 500, it may make more sense to literally have a customized tool that can get that feature and save you a lot more time because you don't have to have multiple fixtures or multiple setups. You literally have a customized tool that can create that detail of that geometry that you're going afterward. And again, that's kind of an analyzing what your time frame is, how many parts you're gonna need, the quality that you're gonna need to, and does it affect what you're trying to do in the geometry and get that geometry done? And the point here, Greg, I think is that this is a conversation too, right? Like you're going to have a conversation with your manufacturer and like, there's no easy answer on this stuff. And it needs to be uh, thought about in the context of the capabilities of a specific uh, vendor or manufacturing partner that you're working with. Agreed, William. And that's probably the key thing to take away is, is that having conversation early and often with a person actually doing the machine or the manufacturing gives you an understanding of what their capabilities are and what you're going to try and get out of them. Uh, again, um, there's different trade-offs. If you go to somebody that has three axis and a trunnion with curt vices, um, it may be cost effective where they can do it for less cost. But if you have somebody that has five axis where they can do it quicker and possibly have a higher tolerance, then you're gonna have to evaluate those things as you kind of design the geometry and move through this process. We've got a, uh, a question here on uh, tolerance stack ups from Mike, and I think this might be a good time to hop on that one, given that we're about to talk about drivers of tolerance. So uh, Mike, without a ton of other context, I'd say my general answer would be uh, there are three primary methodologies for tolerance stack up analysis. So, so there's uh, the worst case approach, uh, root sum squared method and Monte Carlo analysis. And so the, the root sum squared and Monte Carlo, those are both statistical tolerancing techniques. Um, and so I'd say those are gonna be things you wanna look up. They're gonna be applicable for uh, higher volume runs or uh, situations where you have a lot of, uh, a large number of dimensions in the stack where the worst case uh, assumption is actually going to drive you towards over tolerancing your design uh, and a statistical tolerance method will uh, help you keep those uh, those target tolerances reasonable for machinists. So Mike, um, this is an excellent question. Dave and I are actually working on a project right now where we're dealing with stack up heights uh, and basically evaluating how those are being done. And it's at the end of the project and it's very challenging right now. Um, thank you for this question and this comment. Yeah. Dave, do you want to kind of give a little insight into that? Yeah, uh, so a lot of this comes down to what is the capability of the process. Um, and as, as we're moving forward through the rest of this presentation, we're talking a lot about tolerance. And tolerance, as you guys all indicated in your poll, is what skyrockets a lot of the difficulty. Um, but it, like William said, yes, you have the two-part fits, right? Two-part fits actually don't work uh, that's like the, the max min conditions. Those, that, those don't work on a Monte Carlo or an RSS because of there's only two contributors. Um, and then you have your RSS calcs, uh, which are actually, William said it in the least effort, more effort, most effort, um, is your RSS are you're looking there, you're looking at max mins. Um, and what's really important on your RSS is to actually establish what you expect your CPKs to be. And those CPKs should be driven by your design risk. 
um, right? CPK of two is, is basically, um, well, CPK of one, imagine you're parking your car in the garage and it means you're, you're basically barely touching your side mirrors on the side of your garage doors as you, as you go in. Um, a CPK of two would mean like the center line of your car could almost be half, half the way off the distance and you still wouldn't clip a mirror. So CPK two, super, super conservative. CPK one is like the design, the, the, gar the car fits in the garage, less than that means you're clipping a mirror. Uh, and you're balancing those things with your capabilities and your tolerance stack loops that you've created. And it's, like I said, it is a multifaceted problem. And it, a lot of it roots down into what we're talking about here is like, what is the manufacturing uh, process actually capable of? Uh, which leads us perfect into our segue here is like, what are the drivers um, that make tight tolerances feasible or not feasible? And when we, the first aspect we want to talk about on this is you can't talk about uh, the tolerant, achievable tolerance in CNC manufacturing without talking about stiffness. Uh, and so our next topic, we're going to talk about the stiffness. Next slide, please. Uh, so what's really important to understand is that Stiffness is a system attribute when it comes to manufacturing and CNCing a part. And that is one over K1 plus one over K2 plus one over K3 for the entire loop. That includes your workpiece, your work holding, the machine tooling, and the cutting tool. And this is, it's very important to understand. Like if you go look at these Haas machines, if you look at um, any of the equipment used, they're huge, right? And that's because you're trying, they're trying to get the maximum stiffness out of it. And the stiffness is basically going to be uh, the limiting factor for what the, one of the limiting factors for what's able to be achieved. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this really brings us to um, the tool stiffness, all right? So like in that loop, there's a lot of contributors. And first we're gonna talk about the tool, tool stiffness. Uh, one of the ways I like to think about tool stiffness is back to your T-ball days uh, where you would be asked to like, hey, is this, sorry if there's this, my dog, she's sleeping and whimpering. Um, <laughs> uh, so when, when you're playing T-ball and you go up and you, you grab the big fancy bat because you're like, yes, I'm gonna hit a home run. And your coach challenges of like, hey, can, can you even hold this bat up with a straight arm? And that's very similar to the tool reach of like, when you think about the loads or the weight of the bat, how much deflection, how much of your arm is going up and down or how much is, is the tool going to deflect based on the load? Um, so if we go next to, to that on slide 24 here, uh, what are the contributors to that deflection? What pushes you to this maximum effort region is a lot of times it's the length of your tool cutter or the length of the beam here as we've shown as like a simple cantilever and also the diameter of that, of the, of the cutter. And what's interesting to note here is the two highlighted uh, teal uh, contributors are to the power of, right? The length of the beam is to the power of the three as the cross section moment of inertia, the radius is to the fourth. And these things are the radius inversely proportional to the deflection as your length is directly proportional. So these things, as they become smaller or longer, get ex like exponentially harder. And that is where you're going to see a lot of like a contributor to the decrease in stiffness on these things. Uh, but just back to the baseball bat theory too, is like one of the ways to manage some of these is choking up on the bat. So you have to either uh, decrease your load, you have to increase your radius of the end mill, or you have to decrease the length of this. Yeah, and the point here, David, is that with that exponential decrease in stiffness, you're going to see a corresponding increase in machine time, right? Which just means more money, more effort. Yes, more, more, more effort, and or and the harder ability, like a harder ability to control yeah. um, these things with the hit the tolerancing. So moving next is like just like you have the tool, William's going to talk about the stiffness of your parts. Yeah, so the same thing uh, goes with part stiffness, right? You know, you need to have a stiff enough tool to prevent deflection. The workpiece itself needs to react to those machining forces without deflecting outside uh, the limits of your tolerance range. So this is really critical for, you know, aerospace and lightweight uh, structures with thin webs and cantilever features. 
uh, and in particular snap fits if you're machining a part you know early in prototyping uh, that's ultimately going to be injection molded if you have snap fits on that part it's going to be uh, particularly challenging might require some custom fixturing or, or uh, other care on the machining side so um, but right if you're machining an aerospace component with uh, uh, you know a thin web and that thin web deflects four thousandths during machining it's going to be pretty difficult to hit a plus or minus two thou tolerance range um, so that that needs to be considered um, we'll, we'll kind of step through some example parts here to help you build your intuition around that it's it's not quite as easy to reason about as uh, tools because you don't have kind of a standard geometry, right? With end mills, you can largely uh, expect them to be similar enough in geometry that you can think about them as a cantilevered beam always. That's not necessarily the case with, uh, with your part designs. Um, so in this case, we've got a, a, a pretty simple example. Uh, it is a cantilevered mounting tab feature here that's highlighted in red. Uh, you know, and we can think about it in much, largely in the same way that we did with tools, except that that section geometry is going to be no longer cylindrical, right? So you've got, you know, a length of a feature, you have a, a load being applied to it during machining, and then you have some cross-sectional properties uh, of that feature that need to resist the bending loads that are imparted during machining. Um, so from an engineering first principles perspective, you're looking at flexural modulus here. So it's basically the product of I, which is that second area moment, the section properties that we looked at uh, for the end mill, uh, times E, the modulus of the material here. And so there's no, there's no easy answer necessarily. Like we can't say, you know, this is stiff enough uh, analytically, but you want to start building your in intuition around when things might fall apart in terms of machining. And, and you'll, you'll get better at that uh, as you uh, you know, design some parts that don't turn out too well <laughs> throughout your career. Um, and, but really the, the whole point of this is to say, identify the problem area and then apply a simple redesign if you can, right? And so in this case, we've got, uh, we've redesigned that little cantilevered mounting tab feature here, adding a, a kind of a stiffening web solely for the sake of making it more machinable, right? So, uh, you know, as long as it doesn't conflict with other requirements of the part, you know, consider redesigning or adding features to enable machining. You can take a portion of a part that was impossible to machine previously without uh, dimensional to tolerance problems or chatter, or maybe even a dedicated fixture to get around those. And then you can make that easy within the context of common tools and common setups that we've uh, reviewed earlier. All right, so that's, that's stiffness from the perspective of, of uh, the tool and the part. And then there's kind of a system property here. That's why we've broken out chatter as a separate a separate thing. It's not only a function of stiffness, but there are other process parameters that lead to this. And so that's things like feeds and speeds and tool choice and tool path, work holding strategy and, you know, machine control as well. Those are things that you're not necessarily going to have control over as a design engineer. Um, so we're still going to talk about this largely from the stiffness perspective, but it's important to understand the full picture here. Right. So from a, from a first principles perspective, you can think of an end mill as a a spring mass damper system with a really low damping coefficient, um, basically like a tuning fork, right? So if you ring a tuning fork, if you hit a tuning fork, it rings for a very long time. That decay is super slow, meaning the damping is very low. Uh, and that's because you're exciting that tuning fork at resonance. Um, and so, right, same thing happens with an, a tool in a tool holder. You know, without dampening, that resonance is uncontrolled. Um, so you really want to avoid driving the system at or near resonance because you're going to end up with your tool moving all over the place and terrible tolerances, maybe even breaking a cutter. Um, so, all right, so what does that mean for you as a designer? I think the simplest thing is, and probably most impactful, is for you to just try to keep the system stiffness really high. And so that's design features that allow larger diameter cutters and then also design features that are not so tiny that they're likely to vibrate, you know, like a diving board. Um, obviously, that gets tough when you're looking at lightweight structures, but uh, you can do certain things in terms of web design and other features to keep them stiff enough for the anticipated machining loads while, while still making it a lightweight part. Um, and so the method methodology there uh, is basically for you to think through the direction of likely machining forces on all of the features of your part 
uh, and try to locally reinforce them uh, to increase their stiffness. So really this is like, it requires a lot of visualization about what the process is like, but um, you know, again, you can take a part that was previously unmanufacturable without chatter and make it possible. On the machinist side, they're gonna do things like vary the depth of cut, the length of cut, uh, the spindle speed, primarily, that's probably the biggest one because that controls frequency excitation. Uh, and they're, and they're gonna use variable helix cutters and other kind of tricky cutter geometry to kind of prevent that. But on, on the design side, you control the geometry. So I'm gonna hand it off to David for our, uh, uh, our last test for manufacturability. No, sorry, second to last test for manufacturability here at Materials. Thanks, William. So back, back to the drivers of the tolerance of not only do you have the capabilities of the machine, but you also have the capabilities of the material that you've selected. And so it's really important to understand that not every material can yield the same dimensional stability uh, as another. And there, uh, next slide, please. And that when you do uh, the selection of material, right, as a design engineer, you're doing a lot of mainly for what are your, what are your requirements? Why, why does it need to be metal? Why does it need to be plastic, et cetera? And What's interesting there is when things start to overlap and you get Venn diagram style of requirements where it's like, well, I need it to be radio translucent. Okay, can't be metal, but I also need to have it super, super tight. And it's like, okay, well, those are two conflicting things. Uh, because as you look at this triangle here is you need dimensional stability, stiffness, and hardness. All three of those things go into your ability to achieve the tolerances. So when you think about what makes material uh, hard to achieve tight tolerances, you're thinking about the low coefficient of thermal expansion, uh, things that cause local build heat up as you're machining, uh, and then also items of residual stress. As you're taking away and hogging out more material, the residual stress of just the natural, uh, this is like back into your material sciences stuff of, of college, of that residual stress can cause deformation if you start to make things too thin. Uh, if you were ever uploading a part to Victiv and you see like, hey, excessive material removal may cause this part to warp, that is caused by the residual stress. And this goes back to if you're trying to design something that is deflecting um, through residual stress, through just the load application that is greater than the tolerance that you've put on your drawing, which should theoretically be driven from your tolerance stacks, it's going to be really, really hard to do. And What's also another part that is, is was something I remember when I stumbled upon this of being like a kind of aha moment of it's actually easier to dial in super tight tolerances on harder materials. Uh, like if you think of titanium, you think of some of the steels, right? Things that are the big bearing surfaces, right? They're all made of these nice hard materials. And part of that reason is the it is harder to cut. So yes, it wears away your cutter faster, but you also wear and cut away less material and you're doing it slower in a more controlled fashion. That is why it's easier to achieve uh, some of these tighter tolerances. So if you look at a lot of the like bearing books and like, hey, this is this precision for this, it's all relative to steels. And with a big boom in robotics and a lot of the parts we're seeing here, or I see often are people trying to hold um, machinist handbook tolerances, which are achievable on many of the steels, but in aluminum. And aluminum, like the CNC loves aluminum, it loves the cutaway, and it takes a lot of effort to really dial that in for some of these softer materials. Um, and then as we said also, the stiffness of the material also impacts um, the ability to dial in that tolerance. As we mentioned earlier, trying to CNC and do in, uh, like clip fits, right? So your clip fits are usually made for a person with just their hands to be able to do uh, these snap fits, right? That's the purpose, that's why you've designed it. And now you go put it on the CNC and you're now trying to control the, the, the free body diagram load on that little tab to be less than what you've designed it to be for the person to be able to flip, like snap it in. And so, like I said, this all comes back to the Venn diagram or overlapping uh, portions of the Venn diagram of the requirements for what's driving the different choices. And 
when you're making these material choices, it also goes into and say like, okay, once again, how am I going to hold this part? How am I going to reinforce this part if you really, really need it? And William's going to talk you through that. Yeah, one super quick thing on dimensional stability there, David. I think uh, one thing to look out for is, uh, or one way to, th right, right, residual stress is a big part of that dimensional stability. And uh, understanding if your material is a wrought material, if it's, a, if it's hot rolled versus cold rolled steel, uh, basically thing, uh, cold rolled steel and, and, and wrought materials like that are gonna have a lot different residual profile, stress profile to you know, uh, cast aluminum, right? So just understand how your choice of material and actually like the, the material stock manufacturing process itself results in that uh, residual. William, stress. that's an excellent point. I think, you know, through my career, I've worked with a lot of really talented design engineers and the ones that are most successful really understand the principles and the molecular dynamics that happens in materials and that goes across the board of almost any material that you're manufacturing is if you understand how an abs is going to work different than an acrylic and if you understand how a stainless steel is going to work less than aluminum then you're able to design the part and spec material according to what your results you want yeah. to have and it's critical as a design engineer to really understand uh, not so much at a molecular level, but to understand the principles around those materials so that you can basically design to the principles that you want and the geometry that you want. Yeah, and think of them as tools in your toolkit, right? So if I need like a cheap, super flat fixture component and it's not gonna be used in high volume, I don't need to look at steels. I can look at continuous cast aluminums like Mike 6 and K100S. Uh, you know, and if I'm designing a cold rolled steel part that has a bunch of material machined out of it, you should know that that the skin of that part is going to have a ton of compressive stress baked into it. And it's going to leave you with a potato chip part unless you're annealing it or, you know, you know, dealing with that problem in some, some later way. All right, cool. So yeah, so the next test for manufacturability, I think this is our last one actually, uh, is thinking about work holding, right? Really, that's asking yourself, will a geometry that I'm designing, uh, you know, lead to higher cost uh, and longer lead time because of its incompatibility with work holding? Um, so I'm calling this DFW design for work holding. And so this was the, the main reason why we thought about, uh, you know, introducing common capabilities in terms of setups at different machine shops. You want to run your part design through those possible different machining strategies and see, and see you know, ask yourself, does it, uh, does it work with these common methods or not? Um, or is there a method that's at least somewhat close that I could slightly tweak the design of the part to make it compatible with? Um, so the first thing we're gonna focus on um, is just soft jaw compatibility. So that's the next slide, right? Because soft jaw, the soft jaw manufacturing method is like such a ubiquitous and common method in, in job shops for doing secondary operations. It, this really should be your first compatibility check. Um, and that's just asking, can the part be you know, clamp, easily clamped with a set of custom jaws? Uh, if not, can you add some features to the part just to enable this? Or can you kind of recompose the current geometry to allow that fixturing method? And if soft jaws won't work, you know, let's think through the next most complicated common method. You know, like, do we need a, a custom fixture plate or a vacuum fixture if the, if the part is thin and flexible? And so that's what we'll kind of step through next with uh, fixture plate compatibility. So, all right, suppose you have a, a part with, uh, you know, a large amount of draft. So like we're prototyping in this case, um, you know, a part that in production is gonna be made uh, via casting, right? So we've got a lot of draft. Uh, we don't really have any nice parallel sides that we can just plunk down and hold in a vise with a custom set of jaws. So that's not gonna work, right? Um, so for these parts, if at all possible, you wanna have at least one good reference datum um, in this case, I've got it highlighted in yellow. And basically your machinist is probably gonna leverage that datum and any existing features, whether they be through features, holes, tapped holes, uh, to kind of clamp that and hold it in, uh, into a fixture plate. And so that's what fixture plate compatibility is all about, right? Can you have, do you have a simple, one or two simple flat surfaces that could be bolted down to a fixture plate using existing tapped holes or features? Um, right, and can you simplify your design to accommodate that method um, so that, you know, your machinist can then take 
like an off the shelf uh, piece of K100S or Mic 6 that's, you know, flat and parallel to a few thousands already just off the shelf and just bolt that part down and begin uh, doing that surfacing machining. So, um, so yeah, pro, pro, pro tip, pro tip for anybody of like here, you can see that William showed you like, hey, like, here's how I would hold it on the yellow surface if I needed to access the outside. Um, just food for thought if you were trying to, what if you're trying to access the inside of this part? What if there are a bunch of ribs, right? Um, so in my previous life, when I was doing a lot of the handheld tools uh, for, for surgery, uh, we would have, we call them the housings, right? And the housings had these nice contours, just like this part on the outside. But what I wanted to access was the inside. Um, and so when you're, depending on where you are in your design development stage, um, one of the things that was always really important is to save time and to save and keep your project speed is admit that you're probably going to make a mistake, right? If you admit that you're probably going to make a mistake, it's like, how do you recover? You're going to fumble. It's going to happen. How do you recover faster? So I would always make, um, I would take, I would take this part. I would invert it. I would do like a 3% offset and I would basically 3d print a nest or get a, a nest CNC such that I could flip the part over, put it in the nest, fixture it. So that way, if I did make a mistake, I had my nest and was like running to the machine shop, uh, to my machinist to be like, Hey, I thought about you. And I actually thought about myself too and, and acknowledged that I probably was gonna make a mistake, but now I've given them something and an ability to match the contours to help hold the part so they could actually knock it out and be like, oh, let me see, here, I'll bzz. yep. And then I go back test, yep, that was the root cause, move forward. So if you can think about these things and have a, a, a humble opinion that your the 80-20 rule is real, and that you're going to miss things and you plan for it, you're going to be light years ahead of a lot of people because you're prepared. Yeah, that's just a good design philosophy or development philosophy, really. Like understand you're gonna make mistakes and uh, you know, kind of give yourself an insurance policy there. I like that. Um, all right, so that's fixture plate compatibility. Uh, the other thing we wanna talk about is this notion of in-process part stiffness, which is on the next slide. Um, this is, something that your machinist is probably gonna think about more than you do, but uh, when you're getting into really flexible parts, uh, super thin and super spindly little parts, uh, this is something you wanna consider. Uh, and basically this concept is, you know, as a part is being machined, material is being removed. So that part is effectively be becoming less stiff with each operation and each setup. Uh, and so you wanna think through not just the stiffness of the finished geometry, but the stiffness of the, far, of the part throughout its machining process, right? And is this gonna cause problems with the anticipated work holding method? So we've got an example part on the next slide just to kind of show like, this is a, you know, a bell crank looking kind of race car part, right? And basically you've got a big pocket cut out with the through features. And so is it gonna be capable of even being clamped? The geometry, you know, it's, it's easy to design a set of soft jaws to hold this part, but will it deflect so much under load that you're not actually going to be able to hit your target tolerances? And so, uh, and, you know, and what can you do as a design engineer to, to locally uh, reinforce that part for the expected clamping loads uh, you're going to see in that part? All right, I think that wraps up work holding. Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much for um, sharing so much in-depth information on this topic. Um, at this time, I think it would be great to maybe summarize some of the key takeaways. And then for the audience, if you have questions, we have just a couple minutes left before the top of the hour, but feel free to post those. Um, otherwise, you know, William, do you want to kick us off on kind of how you would summarize some of these key takeaways? Yeah. So the top two for me, uh, are just continuations of this notion of think like a machinist, right? So number one is know what's easy to do. That's uh, in terms of the tools, techniques, and machinery and strategies uh, that are common, you know, that map broadly across most job shops, right? Know what's easy to do so you can design within that context. Uh, the next level for me is then thinking through the relationship between your design choices and the impact they have on machining. Right, and that's, you do that by building your understanding of machining strategies and then applying them to your part during the design. 
And so for me to go over three and four here, um, part, of, part of being a design engineer is like you're, you're making something new, right? And the part of that is, is like there are going to be specific special design cases and you have to think about what can I do to reduce the amount of effort? And part of that can also be uh, as you find yourself getting towards the extremes of CNC capabilities, it might be thinking about what is the next option? What is the next, is there an adjacent capability? Do I need to, I really do need that super tight uh, radius deep in that pocket. Do I need to flip over to going to uh, some type of EDM type of capability? Or is this the wrong thing? Am I trying to get a precision out of a gear that is not capable of being made quickly on a CNC machine and I really need to go to a gear hopping machine. Uh, those are the type of things that you as the design engineer uh, need to admit to yourself and admit to the, the vulnerability of the design to actually choose the correct process and or know when to flip over to a different process. And it also, like as Greg mentioned earlier, it also is dependent on where you are in the design schedule uh, and how important each little feature is to making your design work. Uh, so back, I guess I kind of already summarized number four then is like the choice is yours. You have to derive that value. And that is a culmination of not only your own individual input, but also your, your teams and even like the business attributes of what is that prototype? What is the, what is the part that you're making going to be used for? If it's early on, quick and gritty, like it can be a little dirty. It's not going to do quite what it want, what you want it to do, but it gets the the principles through and gets the flow flowing versus, hey, this needs to hit the requirement or this will not work. The project will not proceed if this is not correct. And that is all things to take into consideration as you find yourself doing the least effort, incremental and maximum effort. You wanna save your maximum efforts for things that are actually going to be uh, key drivers in the success of your product. Yeah, and I would add to that is, is really, like we talked about, not only thinking like a machinist, but also understanding how that person works and really developing a relationship so that you know the tools he has in his library and the capabilities that they have. And then and sometimes pushing them and pushing them to expand outside of their comfort zone so that they try new things and experiment new things so that they are not only driving your design, but also driving themselves to be better and to try new challenges and find new things to do and new work holdings and, and all those things that come as soon as with the challenges that we have in the future. So I would say develop a relationship with that person that's doing your work, but also push them to be, you know, challenge them to try and do something outside of the box. Yeah. And do, do your homework too. Right. And especially, uh, you know, these days with COVID, it's not so easy to drop into a shop, but machinists are out there sharing their work on Instagram and all kinds of platforms. So if you want to know, if you want a quick hack to see how parts are made, just, you know, type in CNC machining into Instagram and you'll see people sharing their work or, you know, look up AB tools. If you want to know how custom tools are ground uh, there, that, that stuff is out there and it doesn't take, take that long to learn and it's not super complicated and it can really, uh, kind of supercharge your capability as a design engineer. Great, thank you. Well, that wraps up um, our hour today on this topic of DFM for CNC machining. Um, to get expert DFM feedback on specific parts for your projects, um, you can create a free account at fictive.com um, for parts on CNC machining, 3D printing, injection molding, and other processes. Um, you can also learn more about Five Flute at fiveflute.com. Greg, I'm sure people can connect with you on LinkedIn for uh, you know to learn more and for consulting opportunities. Thank you so much, Christine. Yeah, I'm, I'm open. I'm extremely booked right now, but I'm open to any opportunities. I don't doubt it. Fantastic. Well, thank you again to our speakers and thank you everybody for joining. Have a great day. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Bye.